are going to dive into a series today called Pursuit. And a little bit of the background on, on this series is um, while, while, I was, while we were praying for and, and, and preparing for the follow series, it kind of took this turn in my own spirit, in my heart, where it was like, it's not just about following Jesus. And if you remember, even the last week of that series, and it just kind of stayed with me, and, and, and it, I really feel like this is going to be something, not just that's a series for the next couple of weeks, but I think this is going to be something that we continually come back to, that we continually resonate with about this pursuit, this unified pursuit of, of being closer to the heart of God. And, and in, that, in that follow, there, there was, I, was, I was praying about it, and it wasn't just about following really closely, but it was about actively pursuing the heart of the Father. Because I think sometimes we can think follow just means like, all right, like, if you go, like, I, I guess I'll just kind of walk along behind. Or if you're, if you're following somebody in a car, like you're, you're like trying to be sneaky, and you like want to make sure you still have eyesight on them, but you don't really want them to know you're following them. I think a lot of times we can get caught in this follow moment of like, yeah, I want to be close enough to be able to see where Jesus is going, but yet I don't want to be close enough to be identified with him. I think there's a lot of times, even when you look through scripture around the end of Jesus' life and you see all of his disciples that are, that are so close to him the entire time, and yet Peter's denying him while he's on the cross. They wanted to be close enough to be around when it was beneficial for them. They want to be close enough to be around when the, when the miracles were happening. But what happens when we actively pursue to a point where we, we literally, that's the only thing in our heart? Where, where our, our heart's desire is to pursue the God of the universe. And Psalm 34.10 says, The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And there's this, this word picture that I even have in my head where I was like, man, can you imagine a lion when they're hungry? The passion that they have of like, you know what, we got to eat, <laughs> right? And there's, there's this passion in the pursuit, in the hunt, where it's like, I've, I've got to eat. But we realize that even in the midst of this, they grow weak, they grow hungry, and it all comes in seasons. But those who seek the Lord, those who pursue the Lord lack no good thing. What would our lives look like if we were pursuing the Lord? And really my question for today, we're going to talk all the way through this, but I'll give you the punchline now and let it resonate. And it's this, what is your heart pursuing? What is your heart pursuing? If you really kind of peeled back the layers, what is the true desire of your heart? Because throughout scripture, there's a lot of really good leadership lessons, but the best things that we can learn and what we find out from so many of these incredible people in scripture is their pursuit of the heart of God. As a matter of fact, Moses, as he's leading people out of, the, out of, the, out of Egyptian slavery and into the promised land, at the end of the book of Exodus in chapter 33, God is finally saying, hey, here's where we're going. We've been wandering for a while, but here's where we're going. Here's the end goal. And yet in all of that, Moses' response to him in verse 15 is this. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. It wasn't just about respite from slavery. It wasn't just about some freedom that they were hoping to get from the Egyptians. It was about understanding the presence of God. He was saying, I don't want to walk into a blessing without having you with because the best blessing we can have isn't a physical location or physical things that we could have. The only blessing, the best blessing we could have is constantly being in the presence of God. Moses understood it. Moses got it. Moses had been in the presence of God. Moses has been outside of the presence of God. And what he realized was this is way better. Think about it. Moses grew up in the palace. Moses grew up with every, at that time, Egyptian, whatever he wanted. And in that moment, in, the, in that time in history, they had it all. They were the number one kingdom in the world at that time. And he grew up in the palace with access to everything. And yet it wasn't until he went out on the side of a mountain as a shepherd 
had nothing, had it all taken away, was working for his father-in-law out with some sheep, that he had an encounter with the God of the universe, and he said, this right here, even if I'm in the wilderness, this holy ground is more important than everything that I had back there. His desire from that moment on, when he had an encounter with the God of the universe, was not about going back to the, to the posh palace. It was about getting everything he could to get back into the presence of God. As a matter of fact, even when he went back to Pharaoh, I think we forget about this part a lot. When we, he goes back to Pharaoh, what he's asking for in that moment isn't just for freedom for the Israelites. His ask, Exodus chapter 5, verse 1, says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Other translations, you know what it says? So that we may worship him. We stop sometimes with Moses saying, let my people go, right? Epic line. That wasn't the end of the line. The purpose of the release of the Israelites was so that they could worship. He wasn't saying, hey, just let us go, give us a little bit of respite, honestly, trying to build buildings without straw and make bricks and all that stuff. It doesn't work. Like, can we just have a weekend off? He was like, no, 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 no. Let us go so that we can worship because he had experienced the presence of God. So much of the nation of Israel in that time had grown up in slavery. They were born into slavery. All they had known was slavery. And when when Moses got outside of that for a moment and experienced the presence of God, he was like, let them experience this. That was his desire. His desire was so that they could go worship, that they could understand who he was. My question again, what is our pursuit? What is the pursuit of our heart? Because so often it's for comfortability, it's for respite, it's for, it's for trying to get outside of whatever stress we may be under in the moment. Where even in that moment, Moses understood the greatest desire of our heart is worship. It's to understand what it means to have relationship with the God of the universe. Here he is, leading the Israelite nation into the wilderness, right? Right? There's a lot of things that his heart could have been pursuing. He could have been like, God, you know, it'd be really cool if, if we had a little bit more, more, you know, to work with. Let me lead. Let me be the best leader that I can be. I want to be a great leader. I want to be a great military commander because we're about to go into some places that are already inhabited. Like, let me be a great military commander. Let me be an awesome leader with a whole bunch of wisdom that's there. And all of those things would have been good things. But the only thing that truly matters is to pursue the heart of the Father. Because what we talked about at the very beginning, lions grow weak and hungry, but those who pursue the Lord lack no good thing. Those who pursue the heart of the Father, all of that comes with it. Now we see this moment with Moses, but we also see the opposite side of it. One of the things I love about scripture is there's a whole bunch of flawed people in here. It makes it way more relatable for people like me, <laughs> right? And what we see is after the Israelites get into, into the, the promised land, once they get there, there's these, the, the way that they're supposed to break up the land and there's different tribes get different portions of it. And so there's 11 different portions of of Israel that's there, and then the Levite tribe kind of mixes in as, as priests with all of the other 11 to make up the 12 tribes of Israel. And they all kind of divvy up this space, and once they get to the promised land, after they lead their way into the promised land, they're kind of just like on their own. And there's a point where neighboring enemies and, and neighboring armies come in, and they'll attack one tribe, and then some of the tribes that are close would rally together and, and fight against this, this enemy, whether it be the Philistines, whether it be the Amorites or the Amalekites, whatever it may be at the time. But there was really no structure to it. And they were led by, by judges. They were led by prophets throughout that time. And in the time of Samuel, they realized that Samuel was getting old. 
Samuel's like, I'm getting up there in years. I'm gray. I don't know how much longer I can do this. And instead of trusting God for another prophet or judge to rise up, they were like, you know what we would love is a king. A king would be great. All the other nations have kings. Seems to be working out well for them. They fight their battles for them, which isn't true, but in their head, that's what they saw. And instead of being led the way that God intended them, they wanted to be led like how society looked like it was led outside of Israel. They compared themselves to other places, and instead of seeking the heart of God, they were like, man, it seems to be working for some other, other nations. Why don't we be like that instead? And they said, give us a king. And what we ended up with, what we see in, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, is they get Saul. Saul is the first king of Israel. Again, in this moment, he's anointed king. People are excited. Scripture says he's head and shoulders above everyone else. He's tall. He's handsome. He looks the part, right? That'd be a good king, as long as he looks like a king, right? What more do you need? And Saul becomes the first king of Israel. Now, Almost immediately when Saul is anointed king, things start to go wrong. And it's because of Saul's heart. You see, right away what we see in, in 1 Samuel 13, and you can read the whole story. We're not going to read all of it in there. But what happens in the beginning of, of 1 Samuel 13 is, is he just hangs out in Gilgal. That's the place that he was like anointed king. So he's just living in that moment. Like, I'm just going to hang out here. Like, this is a really good ceremony. It's all about me. I'm going to hang out right here so it keeps being all about me. His son Jonathan, who we find out in Scripture is actually a pretty good military commander, goes out and, and, and attacks the Philistines. In that moment, he attacks the Philistines, makes them a little bit mad, but gets a little victory. What does Saul do immediately? He takes credit for it, blows the trumpet. He's like, look what I've done. He hasn't left Gilgal yet. He wouldn't even give credit to his own son. And you start to see a picture of his heart where he was like, I want all the praise. I want to be the one that people look at on the throne. I want it to be all about me. Until the Philistines are like, oh, so that's how it's going to be. And they rise up and they were like, cool, let's do this. And they start to mount up a massive army against Israel. And now all of a sudden Saul hears about it. And he's like, wait a second. Now I need God to bail me out. And he calls for Samuel. Samuel's like, I'll be there. Don't worry about it. Give me a week. And he's like, I don't know that I have a week. Saul starts to, to, to worry. People start to spread and to leave because now all of a sudden He's not the one that's, that's the man. All of a sudden, he's actually got to make some tough decisions and make some calls on a battlefield, but he still wants it to be all about him. So instead of waiting for Samuel, what he does is he goes and he makes a sacrifice to the Lord, which is very clear throughout Scripture that kings aren't supposed to do that. That's the job of a priest. You don't just walk before the Lord unclean. You don't just go, go do these moments and, and, and walk in before the Lord, especially in the Old Testament, being unclean without a pure heart. And after he does, about an hour later, Samuel comes walking down the street and it says that he goes out to greet him, which some of the translations actually say he goes out to bless him. Literally now, seeing himself, he does not even realize the wrong that he's done. He's like, cool, I can be king and priest. I'm gonna, come, I'm gonna come out and bless the prophet as he comes forward because I have the authority to do so. You know what Samuel says to him? 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 and 14. says, you have done a foolish thing. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God had given you. If you had you would, have been established your, your, you would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people 
because you have not kept the commands of the Lord. What's amazing is, is his pursuit in this moment was for power. He wanted to be a strong ruler. He wanted to be looked at to, as, as someone who was a leader. He wanted to, to have the accolades. He wanted to have the credit. He wanted to be looked at as a strong military commander that would bring peace to the region through his leadership, through his, what, who he was Instead of being a man after God's own heart, this is exactly what Samuel, if you read the chapter before, Samuel says, all right, I'm out. You wanted a king, you got a king. Here's what happens. If you continue to follow God, God will continue to bless you. But if you turn and look for this man to be your savior, it is not going to go well. We are less than two years later, and already things have shifted. Already God is saying, this isn't the guy. He's not the one. Instead, I have found someone who is a man of after my own heart. What's interesting is we find out later the person that he's talking about here is King David. But this is the first reference to him in Scripture. The first rep- reference to King David is not even his name, but it's the condition of his heart. We didn't know who he was yet but we knew the heart of a leader. God knew who he was, not because of the accolades that he's done or what he's done for him, but knew already what his heart was and says, that's the type of person that I need. That's the type of person that I can work with. Somebody who, who's after my heart. If his heart is after my heart, that's a person who can do incredible things. Church, What is your heart pursuing? What is, if if everything is truly pulled away, like let let the Holy Spirit do some work today. Like I've said this before, when I read scripture, every time I read scripture, I hope and pray, and I I pray this in my heart, and I'm like, God, if there's something in me that you need to peel away, please do it. Even if it's painful. Painful. It says that the word is sharper than a two-edged sword, separating the, the soul and the spirit, like, like joint and marrow. Literally, it's, it's, this, this is something that can do surgery on us. It doesn't hack us apart, but it can gently say, this right here we need to remove. That's the difference between conviction from the spirit and condemnation, which is not from God. Condemnation feels like you're a failure. And that's not, God does not look at you as a failure. Conviction does say, hey, we got to do better because I know who you are and I know what your potential is and I know the plan that I have for you, declares the Lord. So let's walk in that. And it's a direction and a guidance that moves us, but there's moments where we have to pause and go, God, what are the true desires of my heart? If it was truly laid bare before you, what are the desires of my heart? Is it to be looked at as a good leader? Is it to be looked at as as someone who's successful in their job because of the things that they've had and the promotions and the title and the office that's up in the corner? Or is it truly to be a person after God's own heart? Is our pursuit to truly know the will of God? There's another moment after David becomes king. And I realize we're skipping decades here. Where it says in 1 Chronicles 13, David is now speaking. He's, he's, he's pushed back the Philistines once again. Others have started to join him. King Saul has died. He is the rightful king of Israel. And what he decides in this moment, as he says in verse 3, let us bring the ark of God back to us, for we did not inquire of it during the reign of Saul. And you know what happened? The people rejoiced. For the entire reign of Saul, he never inquired of the Lord. Now again, what is the ark? Just a little little background real quick. The The ark of the Lord, the ark of the covenant, was literally the the thing that housed the presence of God. He said, so that I can be with you. It was kept in the tent of meeting. 
During the time of the judges, there was a point where, where they had kind of um, lost their way and, and not inquired of the Lord, and it was actually stolen by the Philistines. They were like, hey, look, we've got their God. And they place it in their own temple. They wake up the next morning, and all of their gods had broken and fallen on their faces before the Lord. And all of a sudden, like, disease starts to break out. They're like, we don't know what it is, but get this thing back to the Israelites, Okay. And after that moment, after it comes back, by this point when David shows up, it's literally sat in someone's house for 70 years. It came back, was in their midst, was in their, they had access to the power, yet in it all, Saul never once looked to God. He just tried to lead on his own. David in establishing his rule, said it was never once inquired of my rule. The rule of of Israel moving forward must, at the forefront, understand that we inquire of the Lord. It's not about what seems good to me, but it's about what he says. It's about his heart. It's about his leadership and guidance and direction. And I think what's crazy is is when we just look historically at Saul, all right? Now, what we have in Scripture, obviously Scripture is is written from a Christian context, the Jewish context, the Old Testament. So what we know of is is his failures. We know that in this moment to start his rule, he, he ends up making sacrifices that he wasn't supposed to make sacrifices. The other times that we see Saul, a lot of times he's, he's, cowering in the corner because there's this guy named Goliath out there and they don't know what to do and the Israelites don't know and David has to step up and, and fight those battles. He's, he's in the palace but David is there playing the harp for him and then he's throwing spears and he's trying to kill David and, and, and what we see in scripture is his pursuit of power and his pursuit of David. But if we look at historical context in the years that he was ruling, you could actually say it was decent leadership. He unified the tribes of Israel. He fought back the neighboring areas that, that, that wreaked havoc on them for years into a time of, of relative semblance of peace. And when that peace was broken, it was because his own insecurities of his heart would rage up. And I think there's a lot of times, though, that we can look at ourselves historically and be like, I think I've done pretty good and yet be completely off base with what God had for us. Saul wasn't supposed to be a decent king that unified the tribes of Israel. Saul was supposed to be the one whose rule was was established forever because he walked with the Lord. But because his heart posture wasn't to seek the Lord but to get praise himself, God said, I'll find someone else. And he found a person that we didn't even know the name of yet, but he saw his heart. On the flip side, David was an incredible leader. David was a proven warrior. People were singing about David before he was ever um, sat on the throne saying, you know what, Saul kills his thousands, but David kills his tens of thousands. This is the guy who, who went out face to face as a child and took on a giant. The lore of David was was incredible. Even when you look as he's running from Saul, the people that are running with him, the guys that he's leading are incredible men, incredible warriors, yet he's the leader of them all. He's got military exploits. He is he's an incredible strategy and in, in, in how to how to lead people that are there. Yet in it all, what he wanted to be known for was a person who was close to the heart of God. Do you see the separation of these two men? One stood head and shoulders above the rest. One looked like a king. One desired to be king. One was humble had incredible talents and abilities, but yet gave glory to God. In everything, it wasn't about what he wanted to do, but it was seeking the presence of the Lord. My question, again, for us in this moment is, what is your heart pursuing? Psalm 32 says, A lion grows weary and hungry, 
but he who pursues the Lord lacks no good thing. Jesus mentions again in Matthew chapter 6, seek first the kingdom of God and all else will be given to you. We see this perfectly within the life of David. He wasn't seeking glory. It wasn't a moment where he walked out to the battlefield and saw Goliath and his brothers and everyone else cowering back and he was like, ha, I got this. He didn't walk up there and be like, you know what? I've killed a lion. I've killed a bear. I'm pretty good with this sling. I've been working on it. I've been practicing it in a field for a really long time. I think I have what it takes. You know what he said? You come at me with a sword and a spear. I come at you under the power of God. So no matter what's in my hand is actually just in his hand. My pursuit, my heart is not so that I can win a victory or a battle. My heart and my pursuit is to stop you from mocking the God of the universe who I know personally. That was David's heart. That was his confidence. That's where his leadership came from. But again, the question is, what is our pursuit? Psalm 37, 4 says, take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. When your pursuit, when the pursuit of your heart is to be in the presence of God, when the pursuit of your heart is worship, it's in those moments when we walk towards him that he draws near to us. When the pursuit of our heart, when our delight is in the Lord, then the desires of our heart get fulfilled because our heart is in alignment with his. I want to take a moment as we close here just to have you bow your heads and close your eyes today. And I know we've asked the question over and over again, but what is the pursuit of your heart? Maybe you're here in this place or maybe you're watching online and you're like, man, the pursuit of my heart has been a lot of things, but God hasn't been on the top of that list. And today is the day that you realize, I believe that through the power of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit can, can draw us in pursuing us and it's in moments like this where where if that's happening in your heart know this it's because God is still pursuing you and if in this moment today you're like I need to submit my life I need to submit my desires I need to submit my heart to the God of the universe to allow him to be Lord of my heart if that's you today with every head bowed and every eye closed I just want to ask you this I just want to ask you to slip up your hand so I can pray with you today because I believe that when we do give our heart to him, he will lead and guide and direct us into who he's called us to be. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to take one more moment. I want to ask the question again. If today you say, I need to surrender, I need to submit my desires to God, let Him be the one who leads and guides me. If that's you today, I want to ask you right now in this moment to raise your hand. Thank you. I want to pray for you today. <clears throat> I want to lead you in this prayer. Again, Scripture says in the book of Romans that if we believe with our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that he died on a cross, that he rose again to pay the price for our sins, that if we commit to moving from this day forward as him as our Lord of our lives, that we will be saved. When we 
give our lives to him, when we hand over the reins of our lives to him, he will lead you, guide you, direct you into the best life that he has created for you. But it's up to us to surrender. And that's the words that we're going to pray. I'm going to say a few words. I'm going to have you repeat after me. And I want to ask everybody in this place to repeat these words. Here at Banner Church, we don't pray alone. We believe that we're family. Even those of you watching online, I know I can't see you, but God does. You don't have to be in a room like this to give your life to Jesus. As long as it's sincere in your heart, if you believe with your heart, confess with your mouth that you will be saved. From this moment on, this is your day. Would you repeat after me and say, Dear Jesus, I know that I have sinned. I know that I have fallen short. But today I believe that you died on a cross to pay the price for my sin. That you rose again so that I could have life. From this day forward, lead me. Be Lord of my life. I repent of my old ways. I turn to you to follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Yeah.